So as you can appreciate that a normal thymus, if you see, it looks somewhat like this figure. So you can see that there are multiple lobules. Okay? So there are thymic lobules as we can appreciate over here. And these lobules, if you see, there are areas okay, where the lobules is darker. Okay? So this, you can see these lobules, these are darker. Okay? Again, these areas, if you see, these are darker areas. Okay? So these are the dark areas. This dark area is nothing but the thymic cortex. So it is a cortex part. Okay? And you can see that there are certain areas which are lighter in color as you can appreciate. This is your medulla. This is the thymic medulla. So the thymic lobules, the thymic lobules, they are comprising of dark staining cortex and lighter staining medulla as I have already shown you in this diagram. Now in contrast to thymoma, which is a benign tumor arising from the thymus, you will see that in between, in between the lobules, you are having the adipose tissue. In between, you are having adipose tissue. Whereas in case of thymoma, you are having fibrous tissue. Okay, so intervening stroma is composed of adipose tissue rather than the fibrous tissue. Okay, so this is myself, Dr. Gibran Amar presents to you Simply Pathology, and today we are back with a very important lecture. Today we are going to read about thymoma. Okay, and today we are going to read about part one of thymoma. So what are the things that we are going to see today? We are going to read about the normal thymus. In the WHO classification of the tumors arising from the thymus based out of the fifth edition of the WHO, the clinical features and the paraneoplastic syndromes associated with thymoma, the staging, the molecular alterations, immunohistochemistry prognosis, the generalized gross and histopathological features of thymoma. And along with that, we are also going to see that what are the changes that is there in the fifth edition as compared to the fourth edition with respect to thymoma. So let us begin today's topic of discussion. So before we understand about the tumors arising from the thymus, it is of utmost importance that we understand the normal histology of the thymus. So let us see. So as you can appreciate that a normal thymus, if you see, it looks somewhat like this figure. So you can see that there are multiple lobules. Okay? So there are thymic lobules as we can appreciate over here. And these lobules, if you see, there are areas okay, where the lobules is darker. Okay? So, this you can see these lobules, these are darker. Okay? Again, these areas, if you see, these are darker areas. Okay? So, these are the dark areas. This dark area is nothing but the thymic cortex. So, it is a cortex part. Okay? And you can see that there are certain areas which are lighter in color as you can appreciate. Okay? This is your medulla. This is the thymic medulla. So, the thymic lobules, the thymic lobules, they are comprising of dark staining cortex and lighter staining medulla as I have already shown you in this diagram. Now, in contrast to thymoma, which is a benign tumor arising from the thymus, you will see that in between, in between the lobules, you are having the adipose tissue. In between, you are having adipose tissue. Whereas, in case of thymoma, you are having fibrous tissue. Okay, so intervening stroma is composed of adipose tissue rather than the fibrous tissue. Okay, so this is about the normal thymus. It is comprising of a darker cortex, a light staining medulla. Okay, along with that, the intervening stroma is mainly composed of adipose tissue. Okay. So if you see that the thymus is located mainly in the anterior mediastinum and it is derived embryologically from the third. And inconsistently and to a minor degree from the fourth pharyngeal pouch. Now, during the downward migration into the mediastinum, the remnants may be sequestered in the neck. Okay, and that might give rise to an ectopic thymus. And if we are having an ectopic thymus, that can give rise to ectopic thymus cyst as well as ectopic thymic neoplasm. So, thymus can, uh, uh, you know, normal thymus, okay, can be in another location and give rise to an ectopic thymus. So, tumors can also arise from this ectopic thymus. Now, the thymus is a pyramid shaped bilobed organ which is encased in a, a thin fibrous capsule. It attains its greatest relative weight towards the end of the fetal period. But the absolute weight is going to increase to a maximum of 30 to 40 grams at puberty. After puberty, it is going to slowly involute with age with gradual replacement by fatty tissue. This is about the normal thymus. If you look at the histologic and ultrastructural features of thymus, 
the thymus is a lymphoepithelial organ so when i'm using the term lymphoepithelial you should understand that there is a, a lymphoid component and there's an epithelial component in the thymus that is why they are called as the lymphoepithelial organ which is essential for the normal maturation of the t lymphocytes it helps in the selection of those cells which are going to form the mature T cells and it is going to delete those cells which are self-reactive. That means which are having high affinity to self-antigens. Okay. So as we already know that the thymus is the site of maturation of the T lymphocytes. So those lymphocytes which are not reacting to self-antigens, they will be selected as mature T cells. Whereas those that are going to react with the self-antigens, they will be deleted. So we have already read in details about these in our immune system session. Now, basically, as I showed you, the normal thymus, it is basically comprising of multiple lobules as we can appreciate over here. Okay. So, there are multiple lobules. Okay. So, it's comprising of branching lobules featuring a dark staining cortex and a light staining medulla as we have seen. Architecturally, we have to understand that we are having interconnecting meshwork of thymic epithelial cells, which is forming a scaffold scaffold and it is giving a micro environment it is forming a milieu allowing habitation of lymphocytes okay so there are two things as we said that the thymus is a lymphoepithelial organ so basically there is interconnecting meshwork of thymic epithelial cells which is forming a support and providing an environment for the growth and habitation of lymphocytes now also in the normal thymus you are having interspersed perivascular space which is packed with lymphocytes but they are lacking epithelium okay remember one thing that we are having perivascular space which is containing lymphocytes but there is no epithelial cells in the perivascular space and and basically it's very important to acknowledge the presence of the perivascular space now why is the cortex appearing dark and the medulla appearing light because the cortex is densely populated by the lymphocyte which is also called as the thymocyte so if you see over here the cortex they are dark stain. Why? Because they are densely packed with the lymphocytes or also called as the thymocytes. Whereas the medulla, if you see, they are pale stain. Okay. If you see the medulla, they are pale stain. But we will come to the medulla over here. Now, remember the epithelial cells which are obscured by the lymphocytes, they appear as interspersed naked ovoid nucleus with vesicular chromatin and small nucleoli. They are easily discerned immediately beneath the capsule where they are aligned in a row. I will show you everything with the help of diagram. Okay. Just wait one second. Yes. So, this is the normal thymus that we are looking at. So, we can appreciate that there are two populations. If you see these, these small dark blue cells, these are actually the lymphocytes. These are the lymphocytes. And if you see interspersed in between, we can see that there are certain, you can appreciate these are epithelial cells. And these epithelial cells are easily appreciated near the capsule. So, if you see just beneath the capsule, you can appreciate just beneath the capsule, you can see the thymic epithelial cells, which are the paler areas actually. They are more concentrated and, and clearly seen, okay, just beneath the capsule. If you see individual cells, okay, they are large as compared to lymphocytes. They are having round nucleus, they are oval in shape and they are having vesicular nucleus and prominent nucleoli. You can appreciate over here a prominent nucleoli over here. Okay. These are the epithelial cells and the lymphocytes, okay, which are populating the thymus, the normal thymus. Okay. So, I will repeat once again that the cortex is appearing dark because it is densely populated by the lymphocytes, also called as the thymocytes. The epithelial cells are obscured by the lymphocytes and they appeared as a interspersed naked ovoid nucleus with vesicular chromatin and small nuclei as we have just seen and it can be easily appreciated just beneath the capsule where they are aligned in a row. As I told you, this is the thymic capsule you can appreciate, okay. Just beneath the thymic capsule you can see these epithelial cells which are present in the form of a row, okay. It is present like a row, like this, okay. Now, Apart from the cortex, we are having the medulla, okay. We are having the medulla, the lymphocytes are less densely packed as compared to the cortex and that is why the medullary areas, if you see, they appear lighter. The medullary areas, they appear lighter and there is something inside the medulla, we can appreciate in low power view, this is called as the Hassel's, Hassel's corpuscles, okay. Hassel's corpuscles are present over here. Now, the lymphocytes over here, they are less densely packed, so these areas appear paler okay and in addition to the thymic epithelial meshworks that form the scaffolding over here also we are 
having the thymic epithelial cells but in addition we have something called as Hassel's corpuscles wherein you can see concentric layers of keratinization or central cavitation are present sometimes cystic change can also be appreciated so over here if you see on the left hand side we are having the cortex as we have shown you which is densely packed with the lymphocytes which are lymphocyte rich which is imparting a darker color to the cortex okay so this is the cortex containing the lymphocytes and the scattered uh, thymic epithelial cells okay the thymic epithelial cells can be seen which is scattered and these areas which are densely packed with the lymphocytes okay and the thymic epithelial cells are more visible uh, you know just beneath the capsule just beneath the capsule if you see they are visible now this on the right hand side if you see this is the medullary area if you appreciate now if you see this yes, this is one light medullary area okay so over here the lymphocytes and the thymic epithelial cells are also present but the lymphocytes are less dense as compared to the cortex okay so that is why these areas of the medulla they appear pale not only that they are also having presence of what is called as Hassel's Hassel's corpuscles Hassel's corpuscles are present and some of them are exhibiting cystic change and we can appreciate that there are areas of keratinization as we can appreciate over here so I hope you have understood the basic histopathology or the basic histology of the thymus okay what is the cortex how the normal cortex looks like what is the population what is the medulla why it is light okay what are the things that we can appreciate inside the medulla okay apart from that in the normal thymus as i told you that there are certain perivascular space now normally the perivascular space is populated by small lymphocytes okay and they do not contain any epithelial cells so that is why because they are filled up with a small lymphocyte so basically in the histopathological image it is very difficult to discern or it is very difficult to highlight the perivascular spaces we cannot understand we cannot highlight the perivascular spaces okay the boundaries are very difficult to define by light microscope but the space is much easily appreciated if you do a cytokeratin immunostain now remember that the uh, that this you can appreciate this is one perivascular space it is packed now the space is packed with small lymphocytes okay and very importantly how we can appreciate them because they do not contain any epithelial cell and we all know that epithelial cells are basically stained by the cytokeratin now if you see this area is devoid of cytokeratin okay this area is devoid of any cytokeratin that means there is no epithelial cells present and it is densely packed only with the lymphocyte so this is one characteristic perivascular space that we see in case of your uh, normal thymus okay so this is again very important to document okay so i hope you have understood the concept of perivascular space now next we are going to understand the immunohistochemistry of the normal thymus now as we know that there are two important components one is the epithelial component one is the lymphoid component so the epithelial component remember they will be highlighted by cytokeratin staining with ck19 being the most sensitive which demonstrates in particular the multiple delicate interconnecting cytoplasmic process now what is very important that these epithelial space, uh, cells they are having multiple interconnecting cytoplasmic process if you can appreciate over here also even in this diagram if you see there are multiple interconnecting areas so the cytoplasmic processes of these epithelial cells they are interconnecting and they are providing a scaffold or it is providing a support or a framework for the lymphocytes to habilitate okay this is uh, you know how uh, uh, the epithelial cells are with the interconnecting cytoplasmic spaces okay now this is very important now the lymphoid component if you see now there are two very important things that you have to understand now there are cortical lymphocytes and there are lymphocytes which are present in the medulla so there are certain characteristics of the cortical thymocytes so the cortical thymocytes they are the immature t cells and any immature t cells they are basically expressing tdt okay they are expressing cytoplasmic cd3 cd1a cd99 but they do not express cd3 which is expressed on the surface surface cd3 is not expressed by the cortical immature t cells so what i want to say that the whatever uh, cells uh, t cells are present in the cortex they are immature mainly they are tdt positive okay they are tdt positive okay but they are negative for surface cd3 now these lymphoid cells in the cortex they show a high rate of proliferation now once they are going to you know they will start to mature and they are going to move towards the medulla so as they will migrate towards the medulla they will become more mature so as these cells will migrate to the medulla they will undergo intrathymic maturation where they will become medullary thymocytes now these medullary thymocytes they will express both 
साइटोप्लाज्मिक एज वेल एज सरफेस सीडी रिमेंबर द सरफेस सीडी थ्री वॉज नेगेटिव इन द कॉटेक्स बट एज दे आर मेच्योरिंग टूवर्ड्स द मेडुला द सर्फेस सीडी थ्री विल बिकम पॉजिटिव एंड ऑल द मार्कर ऑफ द इमेच्योरिटी सेल्स लाइक टी डी टी सी डी वन ए सी डी नाइन नाइन दे विल ऑल बिकम नेगेटिव इन द मेडुला so we can say that as the the thymocytes or the lymphocytes are moving from the cortex to the medulla they are getting matured and in the cortex you will find more tdt positive uh, uh, t cells and in the medulla you will find tdt negative t cells so these are all the basic thing that you should understand about the normal thymus now the medullary thymocytes they eventually they will exit the thymus and they will populate the peripheral lymphoid tissues okay this is what happens normally so once they are maturing so the lymphocytes are ready for their function so they will exit the thymus which was the site of maturation of t lymphocytes and then they will uh, you know populate the peripheral lymphoid tissue like the lymph nodes now there is also an appreciable number of immunophenotypically unique b cells in the medulla so there are also certain b cells which are present in the medulla which are thought to be the source of mediastinal large b cell lymphoma arising from the thymus so this is the classical diagram as we can appreciate over here so this area this is the cortex as we can appreciate over here okay so immunostaining of the normal thymus for cytokeratin okay it is highlighting a complex thymic epithelial network now in the cortex remember you can appreciate that the thymic epithelial cells they are more concentrated along the outer just beneath the capsule or on the periphery in the cortex the row of cells in the outer cortex gives way to a loose network in the inner cortex in the inner cortex you are only having a very loose network of thymic epithelial cells as we can appreciate over here okay whereas in the medulla you can see the epithelial cells are more closely bound with each other so this is the medulla you can appreciate wherein you can see that the epithelial cells they are more closely bound with each other whereas in the cortex they are mainly present in the uh, just beneath the capsule as in a row and they are sending the cytoplasmic processes and they are interspersed okay whereas in the medulla the epithelial cells are more closely packed as we can see in this diagram now this is the the, the second uh, ihc now you can appreciate this is the medulla okay and this is the cortex region now we are using tdt now tdt is a marker of immature immature t cells and as we already know that immature t cells they are more in the cortex so in the cortex you can see the immature t cells okay this is the tdt positive T cells, whereas in the medulla, whatever lymphocytes are there, they are mature, so they become TDT negative. Okay, they become TDT negative. Now again, this is the uh, uh, this is an another very important uh, immunohistochemistry. chemistry. As I told you that uh, in, that some B cells are present normally inside the medulla, which is shown by the positivity for CD20. But mainly, if you see in the medulla, this is the medulla, and if you go for the uh you know uh, cd3 if you see the if you go for the immunostaining for cd3 you will see that numerous t cells in both the cortex and the medulla they are staining positive for cd3 now the cortical thymocytes they show less intense staining for cd3 as we compared to the medullary thymocytes and you we can already see now over here the cd3 staining is little bit less intense okay less intense and over here the cd3 staining is more intense moreover if you see the surface cd3 will be negative in the cortex whereas the surface cd3 will be positive over here and the cytoplasmic cd3 will be positive both the cases now we are going to understand the who classification of the tumors arising from the thymus if you appreciate over here there are mainly the epithelial tumors and there are thymic neuroendocrine neoplasm now under the heading of epithelial tumors we are having thymoma and we are having thymic carcinoma now thymoma can be of different histological subtypes like the type a type ab type b1 b2 b3 then we are having micronodular thymoma with lymphoid stroma metaplastic thymoma lipofibroadenoma and the latest addition certain entities have been removed okay then we are going to discuss about that just later on in this later part of the video only thymic carcinoma again they can be squamous cell carcinoma basaloid carcinoma of the thymus lymphoepithelial carcinoma of the thymus nut carcinoma clear cell carcinoma low grade papillary adenocarcinoma mucoepidermoid carcinoma okay then thymic carcinoma with adenoid cystic carcinoma like features enteric type adenocarcinoma adenocarcinoma nos adenosquamous carcinoma sarcomatoid carcinoma undifferentiated carcinoma and thymic carcinoma nos so there are different uh, types of entities under the thymic carcinoma and mm, we will discuss about the changes also okay in the respective section now we are discussing only about thymoma and classification 
Now the thymic neuroendocrine neoplasms, if you see, we are having the neuroendocrine tumors, that is the low grade carcinoids or neuroendocrine tumor of the thymus, and we are having neuroendocrine carcinomas like small cell carcinoma of the thymus, large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma of the thymus. Now, if you look at the introduction part, if you see, okay, as we have already seen that the thymic epithelial tumors, if they include thymomas, thymic carcinomas, and thymic neuroendocrine neoplasm. Now, thymic tumors, they are quite unique, okay, they are quite unique tumors of the mediastinal, okay, or ectopic thymus, which are characterized by a thymus-like organoid differentiation, that is the lobular pattern that we had seen. So, it is very much looking like the normal thymus, that is the thymoma, which is a benign tumor. That is why we are seeing organoid differentiation, including the lobular growth pattern, which is also seen in a normal thymus. There is presence of perivascular space and intratumoral infiltration of immature T cells. So, all these features that we had seen in the normal thymus, we are also seeing in case of thymoma. Okay. So, all thymomas, irrespective of the histological types, are considered to be potentially malignant in nature. Now, remember, only the epithelial component is uh, thought to be neoplastic, not the lymphoid component. Now, the distinct histology of the thymomas is linked to the highly prevalent autoimmune and immunodeficiency states and a distinct genomic landscape. So, uh, uh, thymoma, we will see that they are associated with many or other autoimmune process. Along with that, many immunodeficiency states are also associated with that. We will see. Now, the histological appearance of thymoma may be challenging in small biopsies and subtyping will be impossible in small biopsies. Now, coming to the epidemiology of uh, thymoma, they are commonest in the fifth and sixth decades of life and they are exceedingly rare in children. Remember, it is not seen in children. They are much less likely to be associated with myasthenia gravis and the prognosis is favorable. And the prognosis is favorable. Okay. They occur slightly more frequently in females as compared to males. Okay. They are slightly more frequent in females. Now, the th now, now remember, if we see if we compare all the different kinds of the epithelial tumors arising from the thymus, okay, if you see the in adults, the thymic epithelial tumors, they account for 25 to 30 percent of the mediastinal tumors. Any mediastinal mass, you should always rule out a thymic tumor, okay, of which 75 to 85 percent are thymoma. So, the majority of the tumors arising from the thymus is the thymoma. Around 14 to 22 percent is thymic carcinomas and less than 5 percent are thymic neuroendocrine tumors. Now, in children, remember the thymic epithelial tumors, they constitute less than 10, uh, 1 percent of thoracic tumors and thymomas prevail over thymic carcinomas slightly. Okay, rare cases of thymoma can also arise within a thymic cyst. So, this is the basic epidemiology of thymoma. So, you should keep these details in your mind. Okay, suppose you are, are getting a history. So, if you correlate with the age, sex, okay, and uh, with, uh, so you can be able to, you know, guess the diagnosis from the epidemiological data. Now, the uh, etiology and the pathogenesis, if we see, there are no known environmental factors which are triggering the thymoma development. Now, development of thymoma after irradiation, transplantation or HIV infection is probably it is coincidental. Now, familial thymoma clustering or cancer susceptibility syndromes like Lynch syndrome, myotonic dystrophy type 1. Men type 1, this is very rare. So, thymoma as a part of a, uh, of a, you know, familial syndrome is quite rare. Now, patients with thymoma, they have 3 to 4 times the risk of developing a synchronous or metachronous second solid or hematopoietic malignancy compared with control. So, patients with thymoma, they are having 3 to 4 times the risk of developing a synchronous or a metachronous second solid or a hematopoietic malignancy, okay, as compared to the normal population. A genetic overlap between type B3 thymomas and thymic squamous cell carcinoma suggests that the former can evolve into the latter. Means there is some overlap between the type B3 thymoma, okay, and uh, the thymic squamous cell carcinoma genetically. So basically, uh, they are actually, you know, this is explaining why B3 thymomas they are, you know, proceeding and they are, you know, uh, you know, converting into thymic squamous cell carcinoma because there is some genetic overlap between the two. Now, coming to the clinical features of uh, thymoma, now patients with thymoma, they are either asymptomatic or they present with symptoms attributable to mass lesions, okay, or autoimmune disease. For example, many patients with thymoma, they are most frequently, they are presenting with paraneoplastic symptoms like the myasthenia gravis. 
or they can present with complications of thymoma associated immunodeficiency for example with infections so approximately one third to one half of the patients are asymptomatic and they mainly present as an anterior mediastinal mass so if there is any history okay in your exams if you see that they are giving a history of an anterior mediastinal mass think about thymoma once now one third of the patients are presenting with symptoms because of mass lesion that is mediastinal mass so pressure symptoms like cough dyspnea chest pain dysphagia hoarseness recurrent chest infections okay this is one type of history one third can present with paraneoplastic manifestation as i told you with myasthenia gravis or red cell aplasia acquired hypogamma globulinemia thyroiditis or sle now there is there is some but not absolute correlation of the histological type with clinical manifestation so either remember type a or b thymoma can be associated with myasthenia gravis approximately 15% uh, the association between the different subtypes we are talking about so approximately 15% type a or ab thymoma will present with myasthenia gravis approximately 40% of b1 will present with myasthenia gravis approximately 50% uh, uh, of b2 and b3 type thymoma will present with myasthenia gravis but pure red cell aplasia and hypogamma globulinemia they are more commonly observed only with the type a thymoma so this is the association of the different thymic uh, thymoma subtypes and the various paraneoplastic syndrome now due to the thymoma derived autoreactive effector t cells and defective regulatory t cells autoimmune disease develop pre or post operatively in 30 to 50 percent of thymoma patients but it is rarely encountered in thymic carcinoma now the commonest autoimmune disease to be encountered in thymoma is your myasthenia gravis it is the commonest autoimmune disease in patients with thymoma and it occurs most often in thymopotically active type ab b1 and b2 thymomas okay to the tune of 25 to 40 percent as we have already seen now other organ specific and systemic autoimmune disease can also occur either in conjunction or without myasthenia gravis now immunodeficiencies also result and that occurs because of autoimmune b cell and t cell lymphopenia okay hypogamma globulinemia because uh, for example good syndrome because of presence of anti cytokine autoantibodies and thymoma derived dysfunctional t cell and all this immunodeficiencies in case of thymoma often entails or often causes life threatening infection this is about the clinical features of thymoma now these are the most important now there are many different kinds of autoimmune disease and immunodeficiencies that can occur but the ones which are shown in italics or the ones which are shown in bold are the most common the encounter so under the category of neuromuscular disorders we have myasthenia gravis thick encephalopathy under hematologic disorder is pure red cell aplasia under collagen and other autoimmune disorder we have sle rheumatoid arthritis dogren syndrome etc immunodeficiency disorder we are having good syndrome or hypogamma globulinemia under endocrine disorder we are having addison's disease and thyroiditis under dermatological disorders we are having lichen planus now over here the ones which are most common they are myasthenia gravis limbic encephalopathy pure red cell aplasia good syndrome and lichen planus these five are the most commonly encountered ones now we have already seen now over here this is something called as an association of thymoma with paraneoplastic manifestation so thymoma so how much percentage of thymoma okay is presenting with the manifestation so, around 30 to 50% is presenting with myasthenia gravis 5% with red cell and 5 to 12 percent with hypoglamma globulinemia and what is the frequency of myasthenia gravis patient uh, you know presenting with thymoma only 10 to 15 percent of myasthenia gravis patient is presenting with thymoma or 30 to 50 percent of red cell aplasia patient is presenting with thymoma and 10 percent of hypogamma globulinemia patient is presenting with thymoma. now coming to the staging system now basically WHO has given that all thymic epithelial tumors they are staged according to the TNM system, the latest edition. It is, uh, okay, and optionally, one uh, traditional system that has been used and it is still you know very much advocated that is the Masaoka Koga system. Okay, very importantly, these two are given in the WHO fifth edition, and this one is actually rather the most important staging system. There are other staging systems which are not advocated by the WHO, but you might be asked in the exams like the Mueller. Humling classification and the Suster Modern classification. Now, coming to the TNM staging, as we can appreciate that there are four stages, okay, T0, where there is no evidence of primary tumor, 
T1, the tumor encapsulated or extending into the mediastinal fat may involve the mediastinal pleura. So, T1A is where there is no mediastinal pleural involvement and T1B is where there is direct invasion of the mediastinal pleura. Now, T2 is tumor with direct invasion of the pericardium, either partial or full thickness. T3 is tumor with direct invasion into any one of the following like the lung, brachiocephalic vein, superior vena cava, phrenic nerve, chest wall, extra pericardial pulmonary arteries or vein. T4 is when the invasion occurs into the aorta, aorta uh, arch vessels, okay, intrapericardial pulmonary artery, myocardium, trachea, esophagus, okay. Now, N category as we know, N1 is when the metastasis occurs in the anterior perithymic lymph nodes and N2 is when the metastasis is in the deep intrathoracic or cervical lymph nodes. Then M0 is when there is no metastasis, M1 is when there is plural, pericardial or distant metastasis. The TNM classification, the 8th edition. Now, very important, the traditional system that the conventional cl clinical staging for thymoma, that is the Masaoka Koga system, okay. Stage 1 is grossly and microscopically completely encapsulated tumor, the tumor invading into but not through the capsule. It is also included in this stage. Stage 2 is 2A, microscopic transcapsular invasion less than or equal to 3 millimeter. 2B is macroscopic invasion into the thymus or surrounding fatty tissue or grossly evident uh, adherent to but not breaking through the medicinal pleura or the pericordium. So, this has to be confirmed by microscopy. These are not involved. Grade 3 is where the invasion is occurring into adjacent organs like the pericardium or into the great vessels or the lung which is confirmed by microscopy. Grade 4 is pleural or pericardial metastasis 4A, 4B is lymphatic or metagenous metastasis. So, these are the two very important staging system which is followed by the WHO 5th edition. Now, the histological classification, what are the changes that have occurred if we compare with the 4th edition? Now, the histological classification, nomenclature, defining criteria and reporting strategies for thymomas and carcinomas are largely the same as it was in the 4th edition of WHO. However, there are two entities which are listed in the 4th edition. They are no longer included in the 5th edition which is microscopic thymoma and sclerosing thymoma. So, very importantly, the small thymic epithelial cell nest that characterize the so-called microscopic thymoma, they are unlikely to be neoplastic and their role as a precursor of thymoma could not be proved despite their description decades ago. This is the reason why microscopic thymoma is no more an entity. Number two, sclerosing thymoma, if you see, they do not appear to be a distinctive form of thymoma, but rather represents the sclerotic change occurring in the various types of conventional thymoma. So, that is why it is not taken as a separate entity. It is just one more histological change. Okay. So, these two are the very important changes in the thymoma section. Coming to the nomenclature of the heterogeneous and anaplastic tumors. So, for thymomas that exhibit more than one histological pattern, the diagnosis should list all the observed histological types starting with the predominant component followed by the minor components that should be quantified in 10% increments. An example is thymoma with B2, okay, that is the predominant 80% and type B3 which is, uh, you know, comprising 20% components. So, this is how you should write in 10% increments. This rule does not apply to type AB thymoma, remember, okay, because uh, the, the diagnosis will remain the same irrespective of the proportions of type A and type B like components in the tumor. Now, if a heterogeneous tumor if a, heterogen, uh, if a heterogeneous tumor includes a thymic carcinoma component of any size along with one or more thymoma component, the diagnosis should always be thymic carcinoma with the percentage and histological type specified followed by list of thymoma components. Okay, so whenever you are having any component of thymic carcinoma, you have to write the thymic carcinoma first with the percentage and the histology, logical type of thymic carcinoma along with that you should list the thymic component. Uh, in the relative order of the proportion of the whole tumor. Anaplasia, remember, it is a rare feature of unknown significance and otherwise conventional thymomas. You don't get anaplasia. Coming to the molecular classification or the molecular alterations, if you see. Now, multiomic analysis reveals that there are three molecular thymoma subtypes that are very different from thymic carcinoma. There is an A like subtype which is overlapping with an AB like subtype and a distinct B-like subtype. So, there are three main molecular types. A molecular subtype, AB-like which is overlapping with the A-like and a very different and distinct B-like subtype. Now, these molecular subtypes are correlated with WHO tumor type, survival and the prevalence of myasthenia gravis. 
Now, thymomas, remember, they show the lowest load of somatic mutations. Remember, they are showing the lowest load of somatic mutations among adult cancers. So, they are quite benign tumor. Okay, although copy number variations, okay, they increase as you go from type A and AB through type B1, B2 and B3. So, as you are going along the histological spectrum, the copy number variations are increasing from type A to B3 thymomas, okay, as well as thymic carcinoma. Rare cases of thymoma and thymic carcinoma will exhibit microsatellite instability and a high mutation burden. Now, the commonest recurrent genetic alteration in a thymoma, okay, in as many as 38% of cases is missense mutation that is GTF2L or 2I, even I don't know what it is, it is GTF2I PL424H. This is the commonest recurrent genetic alteration that you see over here. This mutation has so far not been observed in other tumor types and is largely restricted to type A and AB thymomas and is associated with a decreased prevalence of myasthenia gravis and a favorable prognosis. Now, mutations of the HROS, HROS gene is also largely restricted to type A and AB thymomas while NROS and TP53 mutations are much commoner in B2, B3 and thymic carcinomas. In contrast, Genetic losses at 6Q, which harbors Fox C1 tumor suppressor gene, it occurs across the whole spectrum of thymomas and thymic carcinoma. No targetable mutations have been detected in thymomas. Coming to the IHC and the prognosis, now we have to understand one basic thing. Okay, so there are two components in the IHC as we have seen. One is your epithelial, one is your lymphoid component, and we have already seen. So basically, the epithelial you know, normally if you see most thymic epithelial tumors, they do not require the help of molecular studies or immunochemical studies. However, if you have to define some test, okay, uh, we have to understand that cytokeratin staining is done to highlight uh, your, uh, your uh, epithelial component, whereas we have to use TDT component so as to highlight uh, the immature T cells, okay. So, mainly the IHC is used for, for um, you know, it is re required for distinction of type A thymoma from other spindle cell tumor for the differential between B1 thymoma and lymphoblastic lymphoma and for the separation of atypical type A uh, uh, thymomas from B3 thymomas um, uh, from type B3 thymomas which are also having the spindle cells and for thymic squamous cell carcinomas or TNETs. So, when we want to differentiate thymomas from thymic squamous cell carcinomas or thymic neuroendocrine tumors, it is only then that we are utilizing the IHC. Okay, and more in details about which markers we will use uh, will be discussed in the next part. Okay, when we will discuss individual types of thymomas, thymic carcinomas. Now, immunostaining to determine the quantity of immature T cells in the uh, tumor may be required to distinguish between, uh, you know, some type AB thymomas from type A. For example, as I told you, the use of TDT. Now, you will not understand them. We will understand them once we read about them in details. Now, coming to the prognosis and the predictive markers of thymomas, if you see, due to their potential for invasion and metastasis, all thymoma types are considered to be potentially malignant. Overall survival rates at 10 years range from 80 to 100 percent in type A, AB and B1 thymomas, around 60 to 80 percent in type B2 and B3 thymomas and 40 percent in thymic carcinomas and in thymic neuroendocrine tumors. Now, most studies have shown that Masoka Koga stage, it is the most relevant prognostic factor for overall survival in the thymomas and thymic carcinomas, but not in uh, thymic neuroendocrine tumor. Now, the TNM based pathological staging also has significant prognostic value, but tumor size does not correlate with the prognosis. On multivariate analysis, WHO tumor, uh, WHO thymoma type is an independent prognostic marker of recurrence free survival, but not overall. That means the Type A, WHO type A, AB, B1, B2, B3, they have their individual prognostic importance that we will see in the individual types. Thymic carcinoma types, if you see, they are of no prognostic relevance, means uh, basal cell variety, mucoepidermid variety or different types or histological types do not have prognostic significance. In regard to molecular markers, G2F2I, okay, mutation is associated with a favorable disease-free and, and overall survival, while, while high mutation uh, tumor mutation burden, chromosomal instability, presence of TP53 mutation are associated with an unfavorable prognosis. Now, very importantly, high, whether high PDL1 expression is associated with poor survival and thymoma is controversial. Other prognostic biomarkers under evaluation are expression of SOX2, uh, CA9, as well as methylation status of KSR1, ELF3, IL1, RN, and RAG1. 
In contrast to other paraneoplastic autoimmune disease, remember myasthenia gravis is of no adverse prognostic value in thymomas. And, may, and you know, they might also be regarded as having a favorable prognostic value. Okay, very, very important. Now, in a series of 307 cases, the stage distribution is as follows. So, around 44% of the thymomas, uh, uh, they are stage 1, 23% stage 2, 27% stage 3 and 6% are stage 4. The 5-year survival rates for these are 90, 88%, 67 and 50% respectively. The encapsulated stage 1 thymoma treated by complete excision okay, shows a 5-year survival of 100% and a recurrence rate of 1-2%. to For Stage 2 tumors which are having complete resection, the 5-year survival rate is 98% with a recurrence rate of about 4%. Now, thymomas with frank invasion of adjacent structures, they have a high risk of recurrence after surgery, about 30% at a mean of 5.5 years. Early recurrence defined as those occurring within 3 years are often fatal. Now, less than 5% of invasive thymomas will show extra thoracic metastasis, the preferred sites being the liver, kidney, extra thoracic lymph node, bone and the central nervous system. Now, lastly, we are going to just start off okay, with the general histopathological features of thymoma. We will see the macroscopic and the microscopic appearance. Now, remember, generally, this is, uh, you know, there in all subtypes of thymomas. So, macroscopically, the thymomas vary in size from microscopic to large, being several kilograms. They are round or oval, covered by a fibrous capsule of variable thickness. The cut surface will show can fleshy lobules. So, you can see multiple lobules which are separated by fibrous septa. Okay. Now, cyst foci of hemorrhage and calcifications are common. Now, invasive thymomas may manifest by an obvious breach of the fibrous capsule or invasion of adjacent structures and organs. So, let us first look at this gross feature. You can see that they are round or oval in shape. They are well encapsulated. You can see they have a smooth bosulated appearance with a well developed capsule. Okay, very, very important. Now, if you look at the cut section of the thymoma, if you look at the cut, gross cut section, you can see multiple lobules. Okay, you can see the glob, globular structure which are basically separated by very thin fibrous septa over here. We can appreciate. Okay, sometimes grossly you can see invasion. So, thymoma might invade and breach the capsule. So, over here the main tumor is enclosed in a fibrous capsule. An invasive tumor bud has penetrated the capsule and it has lacks of fibrous clothing as we can appreciate. Okay. Now, microscopically, if you see, the most characteristic low magnification feature of a thymoma is the presence of a jigsaw puzzle-like lobules, which are separated by thin or thick acellular fibrous bands. The lobules vary in size. They are geographic in outline and some often exhibit uh, sharp angles. I will show you how. In essence, the proliferated epithelial elements must be present for the diagnosis of a thymoma. Although lymphocytes are frequently abundant, they can be sparse or even absent. So, this is the low power view of a thymoma as we can appreciate. We can see that there are multiple lobules as they were in gross. So, this is there in microscopic. So, there are multiple lobules and each of them is separated by the other and they are also forming very sharp angles. The individual lobules are forming sharp angles and they are, they are fitting like a jigsaw puzzle. So, you can see this one lobule is fitting into another like a jigsaw puzzle. So, jigsaw puzzle-like lobules are characteristic feature of thymoma. The, the, there are multiple lobules, okay, which are separated by a small, se uh, by thin septa and many lobules, they are showing sharp angles also as we can. Now, the epithelial component as we will see over here, the epithelial cells, they are usually large and they appear syncytial, ovoid, polygonal. They often appear pale staining elements among the dark staining lymphocytes. The epithelial nature may be difficult to appreciate except when cellular groups are present at the edges of the lobule as we had already seen in the normal cortex and they can also be seen around the perivascular space. Now they possess regular round to oval vesicular nucleus and small nucleoli. Isolated cells showing nuclear ATP or pleomorphism is accepted but remember mitotic figures should be sparse or should not be present. The epithelial cells can also be spindled with elongated nucleus, fairly dense chromatin with inconspicuous nuclei. This is very classical of type A thymoma. Okay, we will discuss about that later on. So, this is the diagram as we can appreciate the epithelial cells. They are forming discrete groups. So, where they are forming a group like structure, it is quite visible. You can see that they are forming the paler areas among darkly. These are the dark areas which is 
populated by the lymphocyte. These are the lightly stained areas which are formed by the epithelial cells. Individual cells, if you can appreciate, they are having a large oval nucleus. They are having a vesicular nucleus, pale chromatin. You can see the chromatin is quite pale over here. And they are having a small nucleoli also which is present over here. You can appreciate small nucleoli. The background is rich basically in small dark staining lymphoid cells as we can appreciate over here. Now, the epithelial cells, they can have different kind of arrangement. They can be arranged in sheets, clusters, pseudo rosettes, anastomosing network ribbons, okay. Spindle cells, okay, they often show fascicular, storiform or hemangiopericytoma like growth pattern. Microcystic spaces, small round gland like spaces, cleft like glandular spaces, mucinous glands, pseudo papillary formations, abortive, hassle, corpuscles are sometimes found. Now, all these architectural patterns can be seen across the types like A, A, B, B1, B2, B3. So, when we will discuss the individual types, there we are going to discuss in details about the individual architectural pattern. Now, I am just discussing the generalized feature. A diagnostically helpful feature is the presence of variable sized perivascular space similar to those which are present in a normal thymus. Very, very important. Which are bordered by neoplastic epithelial cells and filled with proteinaceous fluid in which small lymphocytes and RPCs are often suspended. Now, the second component that we will see that is the reactive lymphoid component which are basically small with round nucleus and dense chromatin. Now, lymphocytes usually are intimately intermingled with the epithelial cells. Okay, Tingible body macrophages can be scattered throughout imparting a uh, uh, starry sky appearance. Germinal centers are often present. Now, in type B1 and sometimes in type B2 thymomas, okay, they are circumscribed, non-expansile pale areas of medullary differentiation can be seen, okay, in which the lymphocytes are more loosely packed and hassle corpuscle like structure may be present, recapitulating the medullary portion of normal thymus. If you see the thymoma, you are going to appreciate that, you know, that a basic thymoma is recapitulating many features of a normal thymus. And how we are going to differentiate a normal thymus from a thymoma, okay, we will discuss later on as we discuss the different tumors. Okay. So, with this, we have, uh, you know, completed the part one of the thymoma series. And with the next uh, part, we are going to discuss the different subtypes. So, thank you very much for watching this particular video. And do share, like and subscribe if you have liked this video. Thank you very much.